motion. Area grows at four kilometers squared per day. How fast? Is the radius <coughs> growing? to have like, your derivative for like whatever when we do a partial derivative we don't need to list out if you don't want to. Okay, so oil is spilling for the circle on the ocean whose area grows at four kilometers squared per day. How fast is the radius growing when the area is 225 kilometers squared? So remember our note that's like our base formula that we're dealing with. Well, what is it that we're dealing with here? We're dealing with the area, which is growing in this area, is of a circle. So, what is the area of a circle? We have a song like that in I'm sorry you didn't get to enjoy the song. But area equals pi r squared. What's that? So in this case, the formula was not guaranteed because this is more of a like basic, basic formula. But for things like um, like volume of a sphere, those things later are given. So like the more complex, like you know, complicated, but like this is considered more of like a basic formula. Same thing with like, you know, if you had like volume of a cube or area of a square or something like that. But like, the more basic things you like need to know, but then like more complicated. I know that like really Okay, so area equals pi r squared. Cool. What do we want? Well, we're asked how fast is the radius growing when the area is 225 kilometers squared? So how fast is the radius growing? How do we say that? How do we like write that in terms of what we want? Uh, D or DT? DR or DT, good. So that's what we want. We want it specifically when the area is 225 kilometers. So specifically when the area is 225 kilometers. So now remember, usually, and we can always like, if we forget to do that, that's fine. But we can always at this point plug in to find our radius, because eventually we're going to need to plug in to find our radius. So we can just do that now if we want. So if area is 225, how am I going to find my radius? Do what? Plug it in. Sorry, I didn't oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, you're good. <laughs> no, no, you're good. Okay. So how are we going to find our... Yeah, plug just plug it in. in. Okay. 225 plus pi r squared. Oh, Professor, it's recording, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Yep. Right. Yes, here are still. Thank you. Okay, so area, plug in. Okay, so 225 equals pi r squared, so... 225 over pi equals r squared. So, square root of both sides, so we get square root of 
2 times pi over pi equals r. So we get 15 square to, uh, 225. It's 15 over square root of pi. So 15 over square root of pi equals r. Okay, cool. So we have our base formula that we're dealing with. We have what we want. What are we given? Well, the oil is spilling form a circle on the ocean whose area grows at 4 kilometers squared per day. Well, if the area is growing at this certain rate, how do we write that? DA over DT. DA over DT, good. Beautiful. DA over DT equals 4. Cool. Okay, what can we find? So this is where, again, we start with our base formula and take our derivative. Now, if you want, you can use, remember we talked about there's like using the chain rule, there's kind of that like funky like DA over DT, and then you can kind of do that special chain rule thing, but you guys didn't seem to really like that all that much. So we can just do our derivative, how we've normally been doing our derivative in class, which is fine. So DA over D. T, take my derivative of both sides with respect to T. So what is this derivative on this side going to be? 2 pi, uh, 2 pi r. 2 pi r. Dr dt. Dr dt, good. Dr over dt. Remember we need to tack on our dr and dt. Okay? So, I'm looking for my dr over dt. I have my dA over dt. I have my R, I have everything I need. So, I can plug in. So, um, yeah, D over DT is 4 equals 2 pi. My R is 15 <coughs> over square root of pi times DR over DT. So, dividing both sides, I can multiply this to get 30. So, divide both sides, multiply by 30, I like do not a good thing. I'll get 4, right? 4 can stay on my top and I can reduce further. 4 over square root of pi, sorry. 4 over square root of pi over 30 pi equals dr over dt. And I can just reduce to get. Over 15 square root of pi is the RDT. Okay? And if you want kilometers per day. So it's growing at rate. Over 15 square root of pi kilometers per day. Okay. Any questions with this? Vertical wall the bottom of the ladder C 
slides away at a rate of six feet per second. How fast is the top of the ladder? Sliding down. When the bottom is five feet from the wall. So a 15 foot ladder rests against a vertical wall. The bottom of the ladder slides away at a rate of six feet per second. How fast is the top of the ladder sliding down? The bottom is five feet from the wall. So, if you remember in class, we've done problems like this. So, if our ladder is 15 feet, we're talking about that, and we want to know. When the bottom ladder is five feet away, we want to know how far that is. So we have our x side and our y side, which is how is my y. This is my wall, this is my ground. So we're going to be looking at my dy over dx, that's the rate that I'm sliding down. Or sorry, dy over dt. And my dx over d. T is my rate that I'm sliding away. So, let's see what we got here. So remember we had these types of problems. We're looking for kind of like our base formula that we're dealing with. Well, we're not talking about, we, have, we can see we have like a right triangle up here, but we're not really talking about the area of it. But what's another kind of formula that we all can use when we're talking about right triangles? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Exactly, it's our Pythagorean theorem. So, we have here x squared plus y squared in our labeling equals z squared. So that's what we can start with. What do we want? Well, we're asked how fast is the top of the ladder sliding down when the bottom is five feet from the wall? So we want to know how fast is the ladder sliding down. What is that in terms of? What do we call that? DY over DT. DY over DT. Good. And we want it specifically when the bottom is five feet from the wall. What are we going to say? Like, what do we, how do we say that? When the bottom is five feet from the wall. What equals five? X equals five. Yep. When x equals 5. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, let's see. What else do we have? We're given. Well, what are we given? We have that the bottom of the ladder slides away at a rate of 6 feet per second. What is the bottom of the ladder sliding away? Yes. Dx over dt, good. And that equals what? Six. Six. Okay. All right. Well, let's see what can we find. Well, we can find our derivative. Taking this, finding my derivative. If 
I want to find the derivative, I do 2x. And then what do I need to tack on here? Z squared. So my x is 5, so I have 5 squared plus y squared, which I'm trying to solve for, equals 15 squared. So 25 plus y squared equals 225. y squared equals 200. So y equals square root of 200. equals 10 times the square root of oops, 2. two. Right, because 200 is just 2 times 100. So square root of 100 is 10. Then I'm left over with my times radical 2. Okay, so I have my y, I have my x, I have my z, I have my all my other things. I have my du, dx over dt. I have uh, dy over, or sorry, I have, um, where do I have, where am I looking for? And this means something. You don't have it. Oh, right, right, right. Oh, so this is, sorry, going back. My z, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> My z, I already know z is 15 here. so. I think plug in before I even take my derivative here, sorry. I had here x squared plus y squared equals z squared, right? But z I already know is 220, or sorry, z is uh, 15. Use my z equals 15. x squared plus y squared is 15. So, when I take my derivative, this whole change in y, this like, my z, my z is never changing, right? My z is just, my change in z is just my 15. That's going to stay constant because my ladder's not, my ladder's not growing or changing at all. So that would be the same as if I just, just plugged my derivative from the beginning. So I'd have 2x dx over dt plus 2y dy over d. Zero. Are there questions about that? Because I know we just kind of like took a little bit of a turn. Is there any confusion about this? Yeah. So, in like in the scenario that like uh, z is changing, then it's not going to be zero, right? Right. If z is not changing, then it's not going to be zero. Here, this is because. Like, the reason why this works out is because my change in z, my z, is not changing at all. But if you did have a scenario, like, I mean, it'd be kind of, it'd have to be kind of like a different problem because, like, obviously, like, ladders aren't going to change size, but, like, that's why this works out in this way. Right. Are there any other questions about this? Because I know we kind of took a little turn there. We're all okay with that. Okay, so let's go ahead and plug it. I'm using my 
2x dx over dt plus 2y dy over dt equals 0. So let's plug in. So I have my dy over dx. I have my x is 5. dy over dx is 6 plus 2. My y is, where's my y? 10 radical 2. My dy over dt, that's what I'm looking for. Equals 0. Okay. So, can simplify. My will end up canceling if I want. So I can move my dy over t. So dy over dt equals a negative 2 times 5 times 6 over 2 times 10 radical 2. Sorry, I'm trying to keep this on like one word for you. So my twos will cancel. I'll get 30 over 10. Just three. So I get negative three over squared two. So notice here we have a negative. Remember, negatives, when we're talking about rates of change, negatives are referring to like the direction or in which you're changing or if you're growing or like increasing or decreasing or however we're doing. So the way that we would write this is it's sliding down. at a rate of three over square root of 2, what unit are we doing? Feet per second. So remember we talked about the sliding down. The down refers to our direction that we're dealing with. That refers to our negative that we're dealing with. Yeah. Or is that a question? Okay. Yeah. Wait, so would it be inaccurate if I put sliding down at rate of negative? So that would technically be like technically be like inaccurate because then it's like if you're saying sliding down, like the down kind of like accommodates for the negative in that sense. Okay. So like the literal like rate of change of y is negative when you're talking about rate of change, but when you're talking about in terms of the actual like problem, what it's doing, it's sliding down at this given rate. Yeah. Okay. So when you substitute the zero, that's for um sliding down. Because 2z um, times dz over dt is going to be 0 since you're sliding down. The, so the, the reason why it ends up being 0, I mean, so you can either do it, I guess, like one of two ways. You can start by just plugging in like your 15, then you just get a plain old number. Mm -hmm. Derivative of the constant is just 0. Okay. So like you can either start from before, or you can realize like from here, realizing that like my z is not changing at all, like change in d, or change in um, z is like the change in, so like change in x is like how far my x is changing or how far my y is changing. My z is just staying constant. My ladder is not changing any size at all. Like my ladder is just 15 feet the whole time. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. I was just a little confused where you got the zero. Problem. Yeah, no, no, you're okay. Yeah, and like that, so I apologize, I kind of like made a little abrupt change there, so like, are we all okay with this? Like, we're all clear on this. Yes? If we just left it as negative 3 over square root of 2, would that be wrong on the exam? So, I would say just like, keep in mind, just like, go ahead and just write like sliding down at like, whatever rate. Just because this is like, the proper way to describe it, because like we're talking about, I mean, this is kind of where it's like, because we're talking about a real life scenario, and kind of like, if you're talking about, it's sort of, um, 
like when we talk about you know area, if we're talking about like the area of this room, even though we're subtracting areas with integrals, like area itself can't be negative. Like if I'm looking at like the square footage of this room, I wouldn't say a negative area. So it's kind of just like a proper way of communicating it. If that makes sense. Okay. Any other questions on related rates stuff? Okay. How are we feeling about related rates? Any better? Are we feeling way worse? I hope we're not feeling worse. <laughs> All right. Shall we do optimization? Uh, yeah. All right. Another favorite thing to do. <laughs> When we talked about it how or when we were doing our when we actually did our actual lecture on optimization we talked about how like these types of problems also classify as optimization problems and they have come up on past finals as well on the point on the parabola y squared equals 2x that is closest to the point of 1, 4. So remember we talked about the reason why this is an optimization problem is because we want to find the point that is closest. If we have like some just like curve here, right? We want to find a point on the curve that's closest. Well, remember we talked about that's optimizing the distance, right? If I'm trying to find the closest point, I want to find the point that's the, 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 the least amount of distance on the curve that's the least amount of distance from this point here. If I choose like a point way over here, well that's a much further distance than this point right here if I'm trying to optimize the distance. So that's again just kind of why this falls under an optimized distance formula. Yes, exactly. We need our distance formula. So I'm gonna put this off to the side. Distance formula. What is our distance formula? Is it y2 minus y1 uh, squared plus x2 minus x1 squared over 2? So not over 2, but we're doing um, right, square root. Right. right. So y2 minus, oops, minus y1 yeah. squared minus y1 squared plus x2 minus x1 squared. We need the square root of it. Yep. Or you can switch your x's and y's. Either way is good. Okay. So that's my distance formula. So we are optimizing our distance. So remember with these, again, you don't need to use this layout for your final. Like I just want to emphasize that like, you're not going to lose points if you don't write out, like, you know, and now I'm going to optimize all those things. You're not going to lose points if you don't write out those things, but you have to actually, like, you know, are you, you doing the distance formula on the test or not? Are you what? Are you given the distance formula on the test or not? No. So like if this if this like type of problem was on your exam, like you would not be given the distance formula. So you need to make sure that like you would know the distance formula. Are we gonna have any type of reference sheet? Um no. I mean like the only thing that you would potentially be given is if if you're given like a related rates problem and it was, you know, like Finding like and expanding like a volume of a sphere or something, you'd be given the volume of the sphere. Okay. Um, but like things like like distance formula that was covered on in um, pre-cal and um, 
area of circle, volume of the cube, those are things that we can. Okay. So yeah, I mean I would say just like keep that in your back pocket, your distance formula, area of circle in your back pocket, in case if you need that, just like volume of the cube, those are good things to know. If you don't already Um, so, what is known? What am I trying to optimize? Well, we just mentioned we're trying to optimize this distance. So, we're trying to optimize my distance. X, two. So I'm trying to optimize my distance. Okay, well, the only other thing that I'm really given to be known, remember known is kind of more of my basic, like my other formula that I can define based on the information that I'm given. Well, I'm given y squared equals 2x. Okay, so now Remember, once we have like you know a general known formula, once we have what we're trying to optimize, we want to put things in one variable. And so I'm just gonna like so that we see this kind of d equals. I'm gonna plug in for one of my y's. So I'm just gonna call this x minus one squared plus y minus four squared, just so we can kind of get a more clear. Now it looks a little bit more like what we're used to seeing with like an x and a y. We want to have it in one variable. Yeah? Well, why doesn't it cancel out? Why don't these cancel out? Yeah, the squares. So that's a good question. This, the, the reason why is because I have this addition here. When I have that addition, or if I'm like separating by addition or subtraction, I can't just go ahead and cancel. If I had something, if I just had like square root of x, minus 1 squared, now I'm not being attached by any like addition, or even if it was just square root of y minus 4, like this whole thing being times, then I could cancel my squared and my square roots. But that's what, like really important, that's, we can't just cancel it out. And that goes back to way back, remember, like the very first quiz I think it was when we had this issue of like, two, uh, what was it, it was like 2x over 2x minus 1 or something. And, like, you can't just cancel things out. Like when things are separated by addition and subtraction, we can't just like cancel things out. Oh, yeah. I'm not, like, can't you? You see, like separate. You see how you separate integrals? Like you can't just um, x squared minus one squared. I take the square root of that. I don't know. Oh, so, oh, so are you saying x squared or x plus one squared plus? Yeah, you can't do that. Right. So like when it's underneath. You can't just like separate it out. Oh, okay. That's like another, yeah, that's like another rule that we have here. Yep. Okay. So, remember now we want to, from this, are, are we all good with that? <laughs> um, so now we want to put things in just one variable. So I'm going to actually, normally, I mean, like, it doesn't matter if you solve for x or y, either way, you're going to end up with your same answer. But to avoid, like, if I were to right now solve for y, I'd end up having, like, a square root of 2x, like, under my square root. To kind of make my life a little bit easier and just avoid, like, dealing with square roots, I think it's easier to deal with, like, just having square root than, like, trying to do exponents with square roots like that. So I'm just going to actually solve for x. So y over 2 equals x. And I'm going to plug that in. So d equals square root of y squared over 2 minus 1 squared plus y minus 4 squared. Okay. Now, 
The key here, and if you remember back when we did these types of problems in class, there's kind of like a key little, I guess a little trick here that will make your life a whole lot easier and make it a lot easier to simplify. If you remember when we first talked about these problems, if I were to take this uh, like square on both sides, right, I have d squared equals my square root would go away y squared over 2 plus, or minus 1 squared plus y minus 4 squared, right? If you remember, we talked about both of these things, like so both of these formulas, like with, or I guess here, with or without the square root, if we're just optimizing distance, if, like, you know, whatever point this is, is the closest point, squaring that point, like, if I were to square all of, like, the actual literal distances, it's still going to be the closest point. So, this is still going to be the most, like, optimal, this is still going to be the optimal distance, because I'm just really just squaring a distance. So, because I have this optimal distance now, I can just do, like, deal with this formula rather than having that big gross square root there. I don't have to like deal with that. Are we okay with that? We have a question about that. Why are you able to remove the square root? So, so like literally, why we're like what we're doing is like squaring both sides. That like gets gets rid of it. And the reason why it still gives me the optimal. I'm. I'm ultimately trying to optimize the distance. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it still will give me the optimum distance is because like, if I have the closest distance is like 3, well, if I just square everything else, now 9 is the closest distance, but it's still the same point that's the closest mm -hmm. distance. Okay. Is that okay? okay? Any other questions so far? Okay. So, we have this. Cool. So now we're going to find my critical numbers. So that again, that's when we set my derivative equal to zero. So zero equals, let's find my derivative. So I can use my chain rule here, two y squared over two minus one. This becomes a one. Now just times the derivative of my inside, I'll have, um, 2y over 2, so that just gets to be y, plus, now, bring down my 2, 2y minus 4, times the derivative of my inside, so <coughs> times just 1. <coughs> okay. So, I need to solve 0. Okay, so this just becomes my, this just this just becomes a y. So I'm going to distribute my 2 first. I distribute my 2. y squared minus 2 times a y plus now distribute my 2. 2y two minus 8. Let's distribute my y. So y cubed minus 2y plus 2y minus 8. I'm going to bring it over here so we can see better. So 0 equals y cubed. My 2, my 2y two and my minus 2y will cancel, so I have a minus 8. So 8 equals y cubed. So taking the cube root, 2 equals y. We okay so far? Yeah. Where did you get the uh where is the 2y minus 4 times 1? Where did you get the 1 from? On the uh, third one. It's up. Yeah. Here? This? Where, can you see the 2y minus 4 times uh, 1? Where did you oh. get the 1 from? Yep, yeah. so this 1 is just the derivative of my inside. So okay. this is my chain rule. So bring down my 2, oh. leave my inside, and then my chain rule tells me times the derivative of my inside. So the derivative of my inside is just oh, okay. 1. Right. Yeah. Any other questions so far? Okay. Okay, so I have my y. So remember I 
told you guys, normally, like in class when we were doing this, the next step would be verify, like, is this indeed natural Minimax for your exam? You don't need to, like, write all that out. That's fine to just move on to just your solving. So solve. Okay, I have my Y. So I need to find my X that corresponds. I'm just going to plug it back into my formula over here. So Y squared over 2 equals X. Plug in for y, so 2 squared over 2 equals x, 4 over 2, 2 equals x. So, finally, I can just say my closest point. It is just the point 2, 2, my x, y point that I have. So remember with these, again, to kind of recap, I need my distance formula. That's like super important. That's my optimizing thing. That's the thing I'm trying to optimize. And then I can just plug in my values. I'm using the whatever equation they're given. And then I need to remember to make my life easier, I can just get rid of this square root because it's the same optimization. I'm just doing d squared. And then I just proceed to solve the way I would normally solve. And also, again, it's easier rather than dealing with the square root to do my y squared. Are we okay with this? Farmer wants to fence off a rectangular field with area. sides that don't border the river. dollars per meter. Find the dimensions to minimize the cost. So we have a river and a fence, a rectangular area of fence, which is called this x, y, or x and x and y, y. What are we trying to optimize? Well, we want to find the dimensions that minimize the cost. So the thing we're trying to optimize or minimize is this cost. So, we need to figure out how are we going to represent the cost of this problem. Well, I know that these three sides here, 
These all cost $10 per meter because they're not bordering the river. The river side, my Y here, my Y that's down here, costs $20. So my cost is just going to be however much this ends up being, plus that, plus that, plus that. So this is going to be 10 times the number of meters per X. So $10 times those meters plus 10 times Y plus 10 times X plus now 20 times Y. Because this costs $20 per meter. So, just to simplify, 30x plus, or sorry, um, should be 20x plus 30y. Okay. So that's the thing I'm trying to optimize. Well, what else do I know? I know that the area of the field has to be 1,500 meters squared. So, 15, sorry, 15,000 is equal to my area. So, what is area here? 2x plus 2. How do you find the area of a rectangle? Base times height or length times width. So, in terms of x's and y's, it will be what? X times y. So now we need to solve for more of our variables. Last time we plugged in for y, so we'll or plug in solve for x, so we can do that again just to stay consistent. 1500 over y equals x. Okay, now we can plug in. Yep. Wait, why is it not x squared times y? x squared times y for the area? Or because you do like a square there, not x squared times y. For the area? Yeah, I think it's going to be something else. What's the area of this rectangle? So what is base times height here? Mm -hmm. And I just did that by doing 3 times 5, which is 15. So if I have this rectangle here, like x and a y, my area is just going to be my base times my height. Is that OK? Yeah. I was sure. thinking like the question, um, like what? When it's like the box with the square base that's open on the top. Okay, so that's where you get, yeah, so that's a good question. So that's when we get, when we're talking about volume. So volume, you're going to have a third dimension. So if we have like a box with like a square base and a certain height, x, x, y, to find that volume, then you do x times x times y, which would be x squared y. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Any other questions so far? We doing okay. 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 So I have um, I have something for x. So now I can plug in. So c equals twenty times fifteen thousand over y plus. 30y. Okay 
So, find my critical numbers. What do I need to do? Zero. Do zero equals make sure I take my derivative. So, finding my derivative, if it's easier for you to think this is just 300,000 y to the negative first. If that's easier for you to compute your derivatives that way, either way is fine. So, my derivative here, I have a negative 300,000 over y squared because it'd be minus 1, so a negative 2 power plus my. 30, I want to go away. So, 300,000 over y squared is 30. So, I can multiply both sides by y squared. Plus 30 y squared. Square root is y. Yep. Can we go over again where y squared came from? Y squared. Um, right. So if this is my part that I'm trying to take my derivative of, y to the negative 1, I bring over my negative, so negative 300. Y. Now I do minus one power, so y to the minus two. So now I can just reduce this to be negative three hundred thousand over y squared, because my negative two now goes to my bottom. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. We okay with that? Cool. All right. So now my metrical numbers. Yes, verify this is indeed a max or min. Cool. Now I can just solve. I won't make you make that step on your final because that will take time. So you're welcome. Okay, so now I just need to find my other dimension. So I have 1500. I, I always have like such a hard time saying like 100 when I'm dealing with thousands. Like I always like say that wrong. So 15,000. Over 100 equals x. So 1d equals x. So I was asked to find the dimensions that minimize the cost. So my dimensions finally are x equals 1500 or 150 a million meters and y equals 100. You can get points if you don't put them correctly in itself. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> All right. Any questions on this? We've done this optimization process. How are we feeling about optimization? <laughs> We're feeling at least a little bit better than we were. All right. Shall we do some animals? Animals um, can I erase this side here? Do you have anything on this side? I'll 
that we use is this, if we have x to the n, where n is not equal to negative 1, we just can add 1 to the power, divide by new power. So that's kind of a nice property. So remember, we don't have any sort of like quotient rule really with integrals, but what can we do to make this into this nice power here? Separate them. We can separate them. OK. So separate them. So I'll get x to the 6 over x plus x to the 4 thirds over x minus 3 over x dx. Cool. Simplify. Like, instead of x to the 6 over x, it would be like x to the 5th. x to the 5th. Good. So I'm going to just simplify by getting rid of my denominator here. So I'll have exactly my x to the 6th. Remember, this is this kind of my exponent rules. If I have the same base, I can just subtract my exponent. So this will just become x to the fifth plus, now, this is x to the uh, 4 over 3. And I want to minus a 1 here. So 4 over 3. x to the 1 third. x to the 1 third, exactly. So x to the 1 third Oops, minus. Now, this, um, so I think probably an easier way, I mean, maybe you can see it from here. If I write this as 3 times 1 over x, maybe that's easier for you to see what we can do with this. Are we okay with this? Yeah. Okay. Because remember, this would be x to the negative 1, so I can't use that power, but we know what the, the uh, integral of 1 over x is. So now I can just proceed to do my integral. So now I have these nice x to the n powers. So add 1 to the power, divide by new power. So x to the 6 over 6 plus, now I'm going to add 1 to my power. So x to the 4 over 3 over 4 over 3 minus 3. What's the derivative of 1 over x? 11. What do I need here? Plus c. Plus c. Why is that absolute value oh, again? So that's just kind of the way, that's just like the rule for this derivative essentially. Like when you have 1 over x, it's just important to have your absolute value of x. And so it's important to know that because if, for example, this had bounds on it, right, and if I had, like, if this was, like, I don't know, like, negative 5 to 4, when I plugged in this negative 5, it would really be a positive 5. So that is, it's important that you have your absolute values, but that's just, like, part of, like, our definition of what our... Are we going to do bounds related? Are you going to do what? Like, bounds, like, related. Bound. Yeah, we're going to do problems with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll practice some of that. Are we okay with this? I don't have any sort of like, I don't have any quotient 
rule or any product rule or anything like that for my integral so far. Like, I can't really, you know, apply that. But, remember, we talked about when we have things like this where we can't really, I mean, we can't simplify further to get our nice, like, x to the n power. And we can't really do anything else, so I'm going to look at this and see, like, okay, what else can I do? Well, remember, we also have this idea of a u sub. And we use our u substitutions, right, when we have a derivative and a function both in the same thing. If we see, like, a function and its derivative in here, I can use my u sub. So, looking at this, I see an x cubed here, an x cubed plus 7. And I also see an x squared. Well, I know if I'm taking a derivative, I can go from cubed to squared with derivatives. So, let's say u, I'm going to let be my x cubed plus 7. So du is what? 3x squared dx. Don't forget my dx. And remember, this dx comes along because what we're literally doing is du over dx equals 3x squared. And back when we talked about differentials, we just moved my dx over. So this is kind of just, I guess, like skipping that in-between step. If you want to write, if it's easier for you to think about it, writing this like in-between step there, that's perfectly fine. Okay? So, I have, I don't, know, I don't know what colors I can see very well in here, so hopefully the colors can show up. So, I have an x plus 7, or sorry, uh, an x cubed plus 7 that I can plug in for. But I also need to take care of this x squared dx. Well, I don't have just an x squared dx yet that I can plug in for, right? Because again, here I'll rewrite this so it's easier to see. Cosine x cubed plus 7 x squared dx, right? I just moved my x squared over. So I have, I've taken care of my x cubed plus 7. I'm good with that. But I still need to somehow get an x squared dx to take care of, to plug in for. So, what do I need to do here? Divide by 3. Divide by 3. So I'll have du over 3 equals x squared dx. Now I have something that I can plug in for, for my x squared dx. So now I'm good to go. Now I've taken care of all of my x's. So, I'm going to say this is cosine plug in my u. Now my x squared dx is du over 3. So I've just plugged in for each of my values here. Now, this is just a 1 third times du, right? So I can pull out my 1 third, because remember we can do that with integrals, we can just pull out the constants. So one third integral of cosine u du. Did you get the one third? So this I just rewrote this du over um, three as one third du. Oh, okay. And then I can pull out the one third. Okay, so now I just have a nice cosine u, so now I can use my nice sine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine. Remember, derivatives go down and integrals go up. So, what's my integral going to be here? Sine u. Sine u, so, and don't forget my one third here, so sine u. I don't have any bounds, so, and there's something else too that I'm forgetting here. What else do I need here? Plug in the u plus c. Plug in the u and a plus c. So here's a plus c. So I need a plus c. So I need a plus c because I don't have any bounds. And also because I don't have any bounds, I need to now plug back in for my u. So one third times sine 
of uh, x cubed plus 7. Thank you. So remember, when I don't have bounds, I need my plus c. And if I'm doing a u sub without bounds, I need to plug back in at the end. Are we good here? Any questions? Yes. You said without bounds, you plug back in. Without bounds, you plug back in, yes. So, if no bounds, you know, plus C and plug back in for U sub. Can you do a question with bounds? Do you do a what? Uh, a problem with bounds, though? Yeah, yeah, we're going to do a problem with bounds. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to do like. Oh, we'll be good. Are values here. These are technically, I got a little lazy. These are all technically if I have like an x there, right? Sine of x, cosine of x, then sine of x, negative cosine of x. So that being the case, we know what the, or we know what the um, integral of sine of x is, but we don't yet have just sine of x. This kind of goes back to this idea of plugging a function within a function and when that happens, again, that's when we're using this u sub rule if we have a function within a function here. So I, need, I can't just say, oh, well, the integral of sine is negative cosine, so it's just going to be negative cosine. Like, I can't just plug that in because I have something more than just an x in here. So that being the case, I need to use my u sub. So I'm going to let you equal 2x, du is what? 2, two. two. dx. Don't forget my dx is when I have my du there. Okay, so I have my um, 2x here. I just need a dx to plug in for. That's the only other x I need to take care of. Because remember, when we do u subs, it is essential when you when you like complete your u sub, you can't have any more x's. You need to take care of all of your x's. Like you can't have x's and u's mixed together. That's not not allowed. Not okay. So I just want a dx. So what do I got to do? Divide by two. Divide by two. Du over two. Dx. Okay. I have bounds, and I've just done a u sub. So what do I need to do still? I need to find the integral. Yeah. But what do I need to do like before I can even do that integral? There's one other step. Paige. I need to find the new bounds. Is that what you're talking about? So, for my bound for 
x equals pi over 2. Well, remember to find my new bounds. All I have to do is just plug it into this formula that I did for you. So 2 times pi over 2 is just pi. And then for my bound of x equals 0, just plug it in again, 2 times 0 is equal to 0. So now I have this new integral. So going from 0 down to pi of sine u times, now I have a dx, so I need to do times um, du over 2. So I have new bounds, and I've done my use. So, so to find the new bounds, you just um, put the x wherever the u substitution was? Like, yep, okay. yep, exactly. So like to find my new bounds, I just take each of my bounds and plug it in for my formula for u, like plug it in for So remember, this is just a 1 half times du, so I'm going to pull out a 1 half. Integral from 0 to pi now of sine u du. So 1 half. What is now the integral of sine of u? Remember, sine u, we're going to do a single, yeah? Negative cosine. Negative cosine, yeah. So we're here, looping back around. So times negative cosine of u. Now we do our bar from 0 to pi. And now this is where, remember, this is kind of another point. If we do have bounds and we're doing a u sub, you need to plug in for the bound, and you need to, like, you don't plug back in for you after you've done your integral. So, plugging in, basically, like, plugging in for these bounds accommodates for this, like, plugging back in for x, because now these bounds are in terms of u, so it wouldn't make sense to put x's here and then to put bounds in here for terms of u. So we just leave it there. I mean, we're going to, like, you know, finish solving it. We don't plug back in for x. Okay. If you were to plug in for u, would it be wrong? So, if you were to plug in for u, that would be wrong because you've already plugged in for your bounds. The only way, so like the only way that that could work is if you didn't plug in new bounds. So if you like instead plugged in for u and also used your original bounds, that would be okay. But if you change your bounds, you need to change, like, basically like your bounds and your, whether you're u or x, they always need to be the same, for the same variable. Like, you either need to have, you know, your bounds for x, and x is in there, or your bounds for u and u is in there. You can't mix and mingle with, like, x's and u's. Okay. So why did we get new bounds if we could have just plugged it in? And... So, that's a good question. Like, you can, if you want to do, like, plug into again. The reason why it's helpful this way is because you can get, so this is a very easy u substitute, right? Oh, will get hard. This would be more complicated. Like, it'd be a lot more complicated to like plug in values for this versus like just plugging in for you. And like, you can get far more complicated things when you do u subs. So like for this, it would be like, okay, fine, it's not that big of a deal. But like, you don't want to deal with like crazy things doing your u subs and stuff. Does that like make sense? Mm -hmm. We good so far. Cool. Okay, so now I need to remember my bar just tells me plug in for the top minus plug in for the bottom. So I'll have a negative one half cosine of pi minus a negative one half cosine of zero. So Remember, we have my nice uh, where do I put it? unit circle where cosine are my x values and sine are my y values. So pi, I have 
0, pi over 2, oops, pi, 3 pi over 2, pi is just this point over here, so neg negative, negative 1, 0. This point here for 0 is just 1, 0. So cosine of pi is going to be negative 1, so negative 1 half times a negative 1 minus negative 1 half times um, 1. So I'll have a minus 1 half plus a 1 half. Uh, it would be oh, sorry. Positive. Yeah, sorry, that's a positive 1 half plus 1 half. So equals 1. How are we on our unit circle? Just kind of as like a little aside. If we're going to look kind of just a brief review, we have, you know, like our nice unit circle values that we can do. And then just remember we have our special right triangles. And that helps us with our other values. If, for example, we had like pi over 3 or pi over 4, pi over 6, any of those values. So remember we have 1, 2, square root of 3, 1, 1, square root of 2. These angles are my pi over 4. I have my pi over 3 and my pi over 6. So remember going back to, we did this like the very first week of classes, so uh, to, uh, so we can use our special right triangles to evaluate if we had to do like something other than just like pi, 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, if we need to evaluate some of these other values. So like, I don't know, pi over 3. So if we wanted to do like sine of pi over 3, for example, we're looking at this pi over 3 angle. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so my opposite side is square root of 3. My hypotenuse is 2, so sine of pi over 3 is square root of 3 over 2. Same thing, we can do the same thing with these if we had like sine of pi over 4. For example, looking at here, opposite over hypotenuse, so 1 over square root of 2. Usually you see it in the form of rationalizing your denominator, so it's times square root of 2 over square root of 2. So square root of 2 over 2. This is just using our special right triangle values. Yep? Do you care if we, um, if for a final answer, we have like a radical at the bottom, like 1 over a radical over 2? Um, I'm okay with that, like, so long as, like, if you're, if the problem ever, like, specifically tells you, like, to rationalize your denominator, then you, like, have to do it, but, like, for the sake of it, like, I'm okay with that, if okay. you just leave it as one over squared. Yeah. Are we going to get back our final? Like, are you going to get back our So, we, so we're not allowed, I, I don't think we're actually allowed to give back our final, but if you want, you can make, like, you can come, like, and meet with me, and I can, like, go through it with you and talk to you about it. Okay. Um, I don't know, I don't really know why, it's just the department's policy, we're not, like, allowed to, same thing with those pre-calc, or those pre-calc assessment things, we weren't allowed to hand those back, I'm not really, I don't really know why that's the department's rule, but that's what it is, okay. so, yeah. Yeah, because, like, you don't, aren't a lot of the problems, like, you know, old, like, final exams? So yeah, I mean, that, really that could be why, too, because, like, they do use similar problems uh, on okay. it, so, like, you know, um, so maybe they just don't want, like, they don't trust that students won't, like, I don't know, sure, <laughs> not saying that I don't trust you, but yeah. but yeah, so, but yeah, you could definitely, like, if you wanted to, like, schedule an appointment with me, with me sometime, we could definitely talk about it. How long does it take to, like, be graded? Like so I plan on grading them, like, Thursday night, pretty much. Oh. So, um, I don't know, so the other thing is, I, I uh, there is, like, somebody's going to be taking it, like, on Monday for, like, 
different reasons. Um, but then, so, like, I would say probably not until, like, after Monday, and after that person is saying it. So then I can, like, so basically, like, anytime, like, after Monday, Monday or whatever. Yeah. Is the funnel going to be like similar format to the practice funnel? Yeah, it'll be very similar to like the type of like when you see your funnel, it shouldn't be like a surprise. It'll be very like similar format. So like you know you'll have like inoperable problems, derivative problems, like optimization, rate change, all that good stuff. Is there anything on the practice like is there any material on the practice funnel that's like left out that's going to be on the funnel? So you're saying like things that like. So basically, I mean, like, pretty much everything that we've, like, done and talked about, as well as on that, like, um, uh, what, was, what was that, that uh, topic sheet, that final exam topic sheet, like, that's pretty, like, collective. I mean, obviously, I can't, like, you know, guarantee that there won't be, like, you know, some change or whatever, but, like, it'll be very similar to, like, what you've seen. Any other questions? Are we okay with these um, yeah. integrals? Yeah. So, another type of problem. Let's see. Often, problems like find the area bounded. like area problems that are bounded by certain things, this is all just telling us we need to find the integral. So remember, integral just tell us my area underneath the curve. So if this is my problem, just we're given this certain area, I'm given the curve, I'm given that certain bounds, so zero to two, my y, that's just my function that I'm doing, so dx. Sometimes you're asked to compute it, sometimes you're asked to just put it. So we'll just, for practice, compute it just because it's more practice for integrals. So I already have everything. I already have it in my nice x to the n. So what's my integral? x to the fourth over 4. x to the fourth over 4. Do I need a plus c? No. Nope, because I have bounds. So 0 to 4. So 4, oops, 4. Four over four minus zero to the fourth over four. So that's oh yeah yeah it's two sorry <laughs> sorry it's a two thank you two to the fourth yeah okay so if it's already set to like x cubed you actually don't have to do anything else right right set like that yeah okay. yep it's already like if it's already put nicely into your just like x to the n, don't need to mess with it at all. You can just be happy that it's like that. <laughs> so, I'll just have 16, 4 minus 0 over 4, which is just 4. So, if you see a problem like this where it's just like find the area between like whatever bounded region, that just means you do your intervals. Okay. So, yep. Can we go over a problem with E? With what? With E. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. I think I actually. Yeah, and so that's a good question. So when we have these like dx and like to find you talk about finding the derivative like in terms of like where you're in an integral. What is an example of a problem that you talked about? Like something with um where the function includes e. Oh, e, okay, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, I um I thought you said d, sorry. Okay, yep, yep, we can do something like that. Oh, sorry, am I okay to erase this?
the 2x dx, right? I know what's the integral of just e to the x. e to the x. e to the x, same thing, derivatives go the same way. That's nice. But again, this is similar to that sine problem where we had like sine of 2x. We don't fully, like, we know what e to the x is, but we don't fully know what like e to the 2x is. So we need to now use a u substitution for this. We need to say u is equal to my 2x because I can't just straight up do my integral with like e to the 2x. So I need to plug in for this 2x. So du is equal to what? 2 dx. And I have a dx I want to plug in for. So I need to get this to be dx. So du over 2 equals dx. Now I have a dx. So now I can plug in. So integral e to the u times, um, oh, I'll try to du over 2. So now I can pull out my one half, du, du, now I do my integral, so one half, integral of e to u is just e to the u, what else do I need? Plus c. Plus c. And since I didn't have any bounds, what's my last step that I need to do? Plug in for you. Plug in for you. So, 1 half e to the 2x plus c. And that's it. and finding continuity. So just kind of review it. And then there was a few that was about like finding like the limit from left and right. So let's just kind of briefly do that. If you have, I just kind of, I don't know, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Um, building off of these ideas of like the continued thing we had like in your continuous problems. Um, so I'm gonna, like we're asking, you know, after we graph our piecewise function, what's the limit from the left and right? So let's just kind of review that as well. So remember, the difference between limits and continuity, limits, we don't care really like, we don't care what the actual value of the function is, right? Limits only care about what does it look like I'm approaching. And then specifically there's like, I have a limit from the left, a limit from the right, and I have like what I've always kind of referred to as like the overall limit. And so if the limit from the left and the limit from the right agree, the overall limit is that value. So let's just look at like we have, let's do like limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left, limit as 
x approaches negative 3 from the right, and then as negative 3. Let's do this for each limit. x approaches 0 from the left. Oops. From the left. From the right, and limit x approaches 0. Approaches, say, 2 from the left. x approaches 2 from the right, and limit as x approaches. Okay, so the limit, let's look at this value of negative 3. The limit as x approaches f of x of negative 3, and this is again, it kind of got a little bit, I'm going to like pretend this actually lines up nicely. <laughs> Apologize for the poor drawing. <laughs> so the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left. Remember, like left and right limits, I can just essentially follow my finger and see what value does it look like I'm approaching. So from the left, what value does it approach look like negative? What value does it look like I'm approaching as I approach negative 3 from the left? One. One. Alright, I'm approaching x equals one. What value from the right does it look like I'm approaching? Two. Two. My left hand limit and my right hand limit are not the same. So what does that mean? My overall limit is? Does not exist. Exactly. So I'm going to say D and E. Okay. Let's look at zero. What does it look like I'm approaching from the left? One. One. What about from the right? One. one. So, what is my overall limit at x equals zero? One. Good. One. All right. Two from the left. What does it look like approaching? Negative one. Negative one. And what about two from the right? Negative one. Negative one. What is my overall limit? Does not exist. One. What do you mean? One. Negative one. That's good. I'm glad they pointed that out. This limit is still just negative 1 because my two limits agree. My two limits from the right and the left, they agree on negative 1. So the limit is negative 1. What is the value of uh, f of 2? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. f of 2 is 1. So the limit is still negative 1 because my two limits agree. Limits don't care what the actual function is. Limits don't even care if there is like a value even there. But what does care is continuity. So if I were to ask you, is my function continuous at x equals 2, what would the answer be? No, because the limit does not agree with the actual value of the function. So this would not be continuous at x equals 2. And again, kind of like a check for yourself as far as like continuity is remember we talked about like if you have to pick up your pencil at all to like you know, make a point, then it's not continuous. What if I have some sort of like, um, what if I'm going to go like, what if I go like that or something? What is then the limit as x approaches 4 from the left of f of x? Positive infinity. Infinity. Alright, then I can do you know, the yeah. other things. Yeah. 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 Are we okay with limits and continuity? Um, what about, so let's do, let's evaluate a couple. Let's see, limits. So remember, another thing that you guys have to do related to limits. Minus 3, minus 2, 
over sine of pi over 2x. Okay, so checking this out. The first thing that we always want to ask ourselves, can I just plug in, right? Well, can I plug in here? Yeah. Yeah. If I do, limit, x approaches, well actually my limit would go away, sorry. If I plug in, I would have e to the 3 minus 3, which is 0, minus 2. Well, anything to the 0 power is just 1. And it's fine, even if this was 0, that's fine. It's only the denominator that I really care about, like not being 0. And that's 3 pi over 2. Well, sine of 3 pi over 2, I can again use my special right triangle to solve that and figure out what that is. Remember, this goes back to 3 pi over 2. I'm dealing in my third quadrant here. So I have my, I'm really just using my like pi over 2 value, like 3 pi over 2 is this value here, 3 pi over 2. So what is my sine value here? Zero, negative one. So my sine value is negative one. So this would just be one minus two over negative one, which is negative one over negative one, which is one. So if you can just plug in, that's great. And that's kind of often, um, a lot of times sometimes like they'll, there might be some easy like plug in. So always make sure that you check First, can I just plug it in? Before you try some fancy trick, can I just plug it in? Okay. Well, what about limit x approaches infinity 2x squared minus 7x plus 8 over 4x squared plus x minus 12. Okay. Well, here I'm going to limit to infinity. So, there's two things I can do right now. Like, if I, if I were to like plug in infinity, I'd have some sort of like infinity over infinity. But the other thing is, like, we can't really add and subtract like infinity quite as much. So, like, more, like, the more like proper is like way that we'd have to go about doing this. Remember, if we have some polynomial, this goes back to like the very first time we've talk about limits, when we have like a polynomial or polynomial like that, we can just divide my top and my bottom by my highest power here. So limit as x goes to infinity, then I'll have 2x <coughs> squared over x squared minus 7x over x squared plus 8 over x squared over 4x squared over x plus x over x squared minus 12 over x squared. So, limit x goes to infinity. Um, I'll have a 2 minus 7 over x squared plus 8 over, oh sorry, over x plus 8 over x squared over 4 plus 1 over x squared minus sorry, 1 over x minus 12 over x squared. It's important because I remember back when we had like our exam one, some people kind of just cancel this out altogether. You can't do that. It's essential that you still have this 4 here because then, you're, then you won't have like a 0 in your denominator. Now, when I plug in infinity, remember any time we have any sort of like just number over infinity, that limit is just Zero. So same thing, even if we have just a constant up there, that's fine. So we'll just have equals 2 minus 0 plus 0 over 4 plus 0 minus 0. So just 2 over 4, which is 1 half. So wait, can we go over the rule again? So if it's 1 over x, or like anything over x is always equal to 0, correct? Or anything over x squared is equal to 0, right? 
Right, and so specifically when you have like infinity, any like basically like any number over like any like whether it's x or x squared or two or whatever, like anytime you do like basically like that over infinity, you're just the limit's gonna be zero. Okay. Yeah. Now that we know um Lobatov's rule, can we just like you know use that or would the would the would this section like specifically ask you to use this way? So because I feel like the whole, you know, the rule would be like easier to use. So the reason why, and so technically, like using this way is like the more proper, like technical way, mm -hmm. because we're going to talk about like not really technically being able to like add and subtract infinities, and so that's kind of why like the more like technical way would be dividing by your highest power. Okay. 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 You want to take your stuff? No, you're good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> About how long do you think? Um, probably just like 10 minutes. Is that like okay? Or are you good? Or? You can take yourself whenever you want to take yourself. <laughs> okay, it's all yours. Okay. I know where you live, so I'll <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. So, just to kind of piggyback on that. Yeah. So, it's not going to tell us if we're supposed to use the local rule. We're supposed right. to just know. Right. Okay. You will not be told specifically. Like, you'll just be given like, same thing, just like with the practice assignment, like you'll be, just be given like, you know, limits and here was this line. Okay. Okay. But have no fear. When we practice, we know how to do these problems, so we're good. <laughs> okay, so let's just quickly go through these last two things. So, example, limit x goes to zero, one minus cosine x over x squared. Okay. Now, are we good with this other problem here? So, if we were to plug in 0 here, cosine of 0, well that's just 1, so 1 minus 1 is 0, over x squared is 0, so I type 0 over 0. So, that being the case, now I can use my L'Hopital's rule, so equals limit x goes to zero. So L'Hopital's rule again tells me I do the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom. Do not do the quotient rule with L'Hopital's rule. Make sure you're just doing the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom. So derivative of my top, well I have a negative cosine, so what's my derivative? Um. So negative sine of x, right? Because I remember for our sine, cosine, negative sine. Oh, sorry, uh, I said that wrong. It would be not negative. I'm going the wrong way with my curves. <laughs> it would be in fact sine. So going back up to go down, it would be sine. So sorry. Sine over. Now my derivative is two x. Professor Love 
back to his family. Because he also knows where I live, so that's also <laughs> terrifying. X minus 4 over X minus 16. So, right, this is where, notice here, we have a, uh, like a square root of X and the original X. We also have a 4 and a 16. 16 is 4 squared. So, this just goes into my idea of a difference of perfect squares. Limit as X goes to 16. I can write my bottom as, so, uh, square root of X minus 4. My bottom, I can turn into a difference of perfect squares. So, X minus 4 times square root of X plus 4. That's just because I have these squared and square roots in my top and bottom. That's my difference of perfect squares rule. We can review that, or we can go back and review that. So now I have my um, square root of x minus 4, my square root of x minus 4 can cancel. So limit x goes to 16. 1 over square root of x plus 4. So now I can plug in, so 1 over square root of 16 plus 4 is 1 over 4 plus 4, which is 1 eighth. Okay. Yeah. For the previous question, how did you get 1, 1 over 2? So, cosine of 0 is just 1. So, cosine is my x value. Okay. So, real quickly, are we okay with derivatives overall? Like, okay. So, just one thing that I do want to remind you guys of. We mentioned this in class. E squared. Pi cubed sine, I don't know, pi over five, I guess. Pi over, I don't know. Pi over whatever. What's the derivative of each of these? Zero. Zero, right? If you see no x's and you're taking the derivative, my derivative is just zero. It doesn't matter how crazy it looks. This is just a number. This is just a number. This is just a number. Derivative of just a number is just zero. So, in the past, exams have been kind of sneaky. Dr. Malas likes to be sneaky and like throw in like a plus e squared or plus pi or something like, don't get tripped up when you're taking derivatives. Your derivative is just zero, right? And then problems like using my fundamental theorem of calculus, if I have y equals one to the x to the fourth, secant, T, D, T, and I'm asked to find the derivative. Well, remember my derivative, if I have just a plain x here, my derivative is just this function in terms of x. If I don't have a plain x here like this, my derivative is just my, oops, secant, plugging in, plugging in my function here, times just the derivative of my function, so 3x. Uh, oops, 4x cubed. But if, it, if this is just a plain x here, it's just secant. So that's my first part one of my function of here. And then, you know, the other thing, kind of just reviewing. If you're asked to find a tangent line, for example, we have like x squared plus x y plus sine y equals one, and going through point zero pi. Right, we need to find the partial derivative, or sorry, the um, finding the implicit differentiation. So treating y as a function, so two x will be the same. Now y is a function, so I need to do my product rule. So, 
x times y prime plus y times 1, because this is my f and g, plus, now again, if this is my um, function that I'm doing, I need to do the derivative of my outside times the derivative of my inside. So, plus cosine of y times y prime equals now 0. And then going through and just pulling out my y, like getting all my y primes to one side, pulling out my y prime, dividing, and then that will be my slope at the end. Are we okay with this? Do we want to like finish it okay with it? Are there any other questions that you guys had that like other things that we didn't maybe didn't talk about or like you had any other questions? And I will post like once Russell has come back, I will like post this. He'll post it on his YouTube channel and then I'll like give you guys the link to that so you guys can look at the report. function and x defines the tangent line through a certain point, you just do your implicit differentiation, treating y as a function, so x is normal, this is a function times a function, so we got to use our product rule. Here we have a y in here, so we need to use my chain rule, so cosine, like do the derivative of sine, leaving the inside, times the derivative of my inside. So y or x y prime plus cosine y times y prime equals I'm going to move over my 2x minus um, y. So now I'm going to pull out a y prime. So x plus cosine of y equals minus 2x minus y. So y prime is equal to minus 2x minus y over x plus cosine of y, of y. And then to find my tangent line, this is my slope, plugging in my values, and then using my y minus y1 equals m x minus x1 values. Are we okay with that? So, and m equals minus 2 times 0 minus pi over 0 plus cosine of pi. It's just negative 2x, right? Negative 2x minus y. It's not like negative for the, for the top, for the um, slope. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yep, yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. 
So this will be zero, so equals negative pi over now cosine of pi. Well, cosine of pi is just my x value, which is negative one. So I just have pi. So y minus my y1 is pi equals pi times x minus x1 is zero. So that would just be my tangent line. Or wait, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. Yep.